Okay. Hi. Uh, this is Rajiv. And hi. And he's in here today. And he's going to... Right. So, yeah, so there's there's two people teaching the course, myself and uh, Tina Kapoor. Uh, she's going to be here on Friday. And uh, let me just start by uh, going through with the agenda of what we're going to go through today. First, I'm going to give you some motivating examples about why we're trying to talk about or tr teach this course to you all now that you've had uh, ten, 10 or so months of <coughs> computer, a computer science curriculum. Um, then I'm going to go over the outline of the course as well as our grading policy. Um, and then I'll start into the lectures. And today we're going to start with algebra events and start on conditional probability. Um, let's see here. So the first, I guess, I guess that the actually maybe I should go back. I guess that the the, the, um, the purpose of this course is really um, to take. I, I guess before this, you were basically dealing with a lot of deterministic systems. So when you came and solved the problem, you kind of felt like, well, I. Uh, I know all all the uh, I, I know I know what's I know exactly what's going on and here's the solution, uh, except maybe when you were doing search problems where you didn't have the computational resources to search everything or maybe like say for example in AI um, where you might try some deter you know some some methods for trying to search that are heuristic based that may or may not return a result quickly, um, and I think that that what's interesting when I took this course in, at MIT was that um, for me, it's actually been one of the uh, most uh, applicable courses I've ever taken. You know, I apply it in things like when I do my investing, when I do uh, when I when I do different projects for different people. It always comes up because it's really the uh, the you know dealing with uncertainty is probably uh, one of the hardest things to deal with in the sense that you know you don't ever know if you're quite right or whether your algorithm is going to work, but you know that it probably will. Um, and then uh, in the rest, I guess now I'm going to get into some motivating examples of why, you know, studying this kind of stuff is worth worthwhile. Um, so one thing I did for my PhD thesis uh, at MIT was to work on a system that had some non-determinism in it. In that, I guess, uh, or at least it's it's uh, it, it's something where there's some uncertainty. And w w what the I idea was was I've got to build a projection system um, that can display, uh, a, 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 I guess, a single picture. But the point is to use uh, more than one projector. So here we've got one projector, and it's projecting, and it works quite well. But imagine that you have four projectors, and you can kind of see over here uh, a model where there are two projectors connected to a computer. And in the example that I did, um, there are four projectors. And you can see how they're over the images are overlapped. Um, and the point is, is that you can actually create a very high resolution screen out of a bunch of really cheap, um, smaller resolution screens. And the way you do that is that you um, basically take, uh, take, y you take, you overlap the images and you modulate the signal going into, uh, into the projectors such that it creates a corrected image. And below you, what you see is a image that's actually being displayed on that same set of four projectors, but it's been corrected. Um, and the, the point about the probability and statistics that comes in here is in the feedback system. And the thing is, is that you've got a camera that takes a look at what's wrong with the system. It tries to figure out where the, uh, where the, uh, where the projectors are projecting. And I guess the thing about that is that, you know, basically when you're, when you're, when you're trying to uh, measure something like that, you've got a, Analog to digital converter, and a signal's coming in from the camera, and you know maybe the signal's you know like this or something like that, and what ends up happening is is that you, uh, in discretizing it, you know in the, in the ideal case you would end up just discretizing it and getting a perfect, um, you know, or not a perfect but a very good sample set. But in reality, what happens is there's noise that's introduced, so actually this signal you know kind of looks like this. And the trick is to try to recover it, you know, based on this noisy signal, so that you know from the noisy signal that's sampled, um, you actually get um, you actually get uh, the correct signal back. And, and the point is, is that in this system, I had to do some modeling uh, that you know that that required me to go back to this kind of probability and statistics thing, uh, this probability and statistics stuff to, to come up with what the models are. And a lot of times you see this kind of stuff happening in machine vision. And that's an example of machine vision. Another example 
um, which is actually uh, something you guys are going to work on on a problem set, is something that um, uh, that Tina is ex an expert at, which is image segmentation based on, uh, you know, here's a bunch of data, MRI, da MRI data. Um, can you tell what the gray matter is in the image? And oh, furthermore, can you tell what might be uh, cancerous based on um, the uh, input that's that's kind of that, that based on what the image data looks like? You might look at a pixel, look at the surrounding pixel data, and based on uh, some model of what uh, you know gray matter is or what what a cancerous uh, s uh, cell might look like in a bunch of MRI data, you can segment this segment. Or, sorry, you can segment the image and say this data. Indicates a, uh, you know, indicates that at this particular point, it is likely that that particular pixel, which is located somewhere in someone's, you know, it's a representation of something in someone's head, um, is actually cancerous. So when you're actually doing surgery, and that's kind of something that T Tina worked on, um, is uh, you, know, you can try to make it easier for the brain surgeon to uh, try to make sure that he's getting out all the cancerous cells by creating a tool that lets him see, um, at least at some level where you think the cancerous cells are. Um, so then another example that in my, in my real life that came up where I had to use this stuff was, uh, you know, I was asked a question about two years ago, how, you know, this system that you've built, uh, you know, how do we know that it's scalable and robust? I built a, a system that I, I could show them that, you know, with 1,000 users it worked well and with 10,000 users it worked well, but how, how did they know that it would work well for 20 million users and what I had to do was I had to come out and say, well, here's some here's some modeling of uh, you know modeling based on Poisson processes and assumptions that will allow you to you know decide how much uh, how many servers to buy. And, and I know that you you had a systems course, um, and these are all things that come up. And there's some nice courses that are taught at MIT about queuing theory that all sort of are based on the you know, the foundations of probabilistic systems um, that let you start thinking about these issues. Um, and then just this weekend, actually, I came across something that I'm looking at investing in, and that's um, a, uh, a company that does, uh, it basically, in, 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 in the power industry, they, uh, uh, they basically have, uh, I guess, in, in steam plant, or sorry, in coal plants, they have, you know, they're, they're, I guess they're burning the coal, and, and there, are, there are these big steam pipes um, that are under really high pressure, and if those things burst, um, then you know there's millions of dollars of, of damage, and what's worse is that if you have a power plant uh, and it goes down, then for every hour that it's down, you're losing a lot of money. And so um, here's an example um, where someone has come up with some methodologies for uh, non-destructively measuring um, the acoustic emissions from several points along the pipe, and then they can determine, oh well. Um, we think that there's a crack at this particular location. And given that there's a crack at this particular location, how long do we think that the pipe will last before you have to address that, that problem? And uh, even, in, even, even there, there are examples where it may not be just, it's, it's knowing that there's a problem and knowing how long you have to fix it. So maybe you can schedule um, a, a shutdown and avoid bursting the pipe or try to schedule shutdown to deal with 10 different items that need to be done rather than one. Um, so that you can, uh, you know, save money. Um, so let me go and jump into uh, how the course is going to sort of work. We're going to talk today about algebra of events, uh, conditional probability. Uh, then we're going to move into uh, Bayes' theorem after a little bit more conditional probability. Then on Thursday we're going to talk something, uh, start to talk about random variables. <coughs> on Friday, uh, Tina is going to start talking about Gaussian random variables. Uh, and then we'll move into uh, maximum likelihood estimation. And then uh, Tuesday, which is your last class, we'll work on maximum likelihood estimation-based segmentation. Um, and I, I, won't look, I wouldn't look at this course as it's sort of like a taste of all the different things. We're not going to go extremely in-depth and, and prove a lot of things. Um, we're just going to try to be very practical about showing you things that, that you should know um, and that are, are very practical to use. Um, then on Wednesday there's an exam, and we'll talk about the exam results, and then uh, hopefully Ravi will come in. Uh, one thing with Ravi is is that he has a, a baby on the way, and, I, and the pregnant. I guess it's scheduled for for the 14th, but somehow he agreed that he'd come in. So I I can't guarantee that 
he won't come in, but if he want if he doesn't come in, I'll come up with something else. I'll take you guys all out somewhere. But um, all right, you, so maybe you're hoping that maybe you're hoping that he doesn't show up. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, the grading, which is which is probably an, another interesting point, is we have uh, six problem sets, uh, and I, b I believe it's six problem sets. One final exam, and we're going to grade you based mostly on the problem sets and 25% on the exam. Uh, so let me start jumping into to this. Um, the first thing you kind of need to deal with with regard to uh, uh, probability is uh, having a language. And this is for, for describing uh, describing events, or at least a language for describing how you uh, model an experiment. And what we're going to go through a little bit at the start is you know, this notion of the algebra of events. And I think you guys have seen stuff like this, but and, and this may be a review, but I'd like to, to spend the day uh, talking about that. So uh, one of the things is that uh, when you model a, a system, you know, you, there's a lot of different types of experimental outcomes. And the point is, is that in the algebra of events, an event is simply a point in a space where the space is defined by all the possible um, events. So an example of that might be, you know, when I flip a coin uh, that has a head and tail, like a, like a penny, um, the experimental space might consist of the event that it's a head or the event that it's a tail, um, and, that, and it's a two-point space. Um, another example might be, well, you know, I'm playing roulette, and, you know, there are, uh, there's, I don't know, I can't remember how many, there's like 30 or so, what is it, 30, 38? So there's 38, 38 spots, discrete spots, and you have a 1 in 38 chance of, you know, the, the points are the 38 numbers, and depending upon how these things are spaced, you have a one in 38 chance of getting a particular a particular number. Um, and another example might be, which isn't discrete, is having uh, a spinner between zero and one, like on a clock, uh, or like like having a clock. What's the wh the points are any particular point between zero and one? You know, there th and each point is equally likely. Um, so. Uh, when we start talking about a set that is kind of important of all the events in, a, in, in, a, in an event space, um, we talk about that and we call it the universal set. And usually you denote that U. Um, the the, uh, the complement of a set of events, so I can say that uh, a set of events is you know, a bunch of point, points in the space. The complement of that is all the other points in the space. Um, and there's there's a set that we call the, the null set that basically contains no points. Its complement, of course, is the universal set. Um, and then we can move on to the next thing, which you're familiar with, which is simply the intersection of two sets of events. An event set A and an event set B, if, uh, two, two, uh, if, the, if the set of events are intersecting, then um, we denote that AB. So it might be if I... if um, uh, if I had a set of events like uh, tossing the heads, uh, to tossing, to tossing a coin twice, um, and I say, oh, the events, one set of events are the events that, um, that it contains heads, and the other one is the, uh, the set of events which, you know, event set B is the event set where um, the set, the, sorry, the events contain um, tails, um, then the intersection of those events would be uh, something that had a head and tail, or a tail and head. Um, and then we, let's move on to uh, the union of the set of events. Um, well, uh, the union of the set of events is to take all the events in both sets and combine them. And we denote that A plus B. And I think there's some you know, other interesting notions like uh, the set of events, um, you know, two sets of events in U are equal if um, every point in A is also in B, and every point of U not in sorry not in A prime is also in, in B prime. Rather, I, mean, I guess I guess the point is is that if every point in one set is in the other is in the other set and vice versa, then then the two sets are equal. Um, and here's here's sort of the you know based, basically if you take these seven axioms um, of the algebra of events. Um, and you can, we can go through each of them, and they're the it's fairly, you know, they're the fairly standard set, which is that, you know, there's the commutative law that the, uh, I guess, 
I guess the union of A and B is equal to the union of B and A, and the union, and there's this, the associative law that you know basically tells you that however you take the union of these things, it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, what order you do it in. Uh, and then there's the distributive law that allows you to distribute, um, to distribute. And then there's some some more. One of the ones that's kind of interesting is the De Morgan's law. Have you guys seen? You've seen De Morgan's law? Okay, so that's so that's one that that you know applies there too. And I think on the problem set, you'll see a lot of application of that in proving some of these, the, some of the relations that, that you use. And then um, two fairly straightforward ones are that the intersection of, uh, you know, a, a, an event A and its complement is the null set, and the intersection of, of uh, the of set of events A and the uh, universal set is it, the set itself A. Um, and I guess I guess there's some interesting derivable relations that you can get out of this. That you know, one of them is that uh, if you take the union of the set of events with itself, you get the same set of events. Uh, if you take the set of the union, sorry, if you take a set of events and uh, like A and a subset of its events, you still get the same set of events. Um, and I'm just going through these in words so that you kind of get a sense of what you know. It's 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 a lot of symbols, but it's easier to sometimes think about it that way. Another another example. Might be, uh, 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 you know, uh, you could simply write like this: a, a plus a prime b equals a plus b. Uh, that that's, you know, if you rewrite that, you know, you can rewrite that as um, a plus a b plus a prime b, and that gets you to a plus b. Um, uh, I guess using the, you know the distributive law. That you, know, you can you can the set of the sets sorry you, you can you, you can go through and prove prove all these things I think it's fairly obvious how to how, how to do that the, the second two are, are kind of interesting to use and in, in the tutorials I'm going to ask you to actually uh, use those uh, or prove some of these things and uh, let's, I guess we can go down to um, a kind of uh, another set part of the language is uh, the notion of a mutually exclusive set of events. And a set of collectively exhaustive set of events, and a set of mutually exclusive events are um, basically if the set of events don't intersect. You know, if you have a bunch of a, a set of a bunch of sets of events, if those sets of events don't intersect, then they're mutually exclusive. So in this diagram, for example, the sets A and B are uh, you know mutually ex exclusive of each other, um, but the the set U and any particular set um, like an a, like a or b uh, is are not mutually exclusive. So a is not mutually exclusive of the universal set. Um, then we move on to um, being collectively exhaustive. And the point of being collectively exhaustive is if I take the, um, the union of all the sets of events that 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 you've uh, described, am I able to come up with the universal set? Um, if the answer is yes, then you know you've got a collectively exhaustive set. And the reason why this is interesting and is is that is if you combine the two terms, you end up getting something what we call uh, you know the events of the sample space, and this is the tool that you'll use sort of to uh, deal with all sorts of probabilistic problems. What you need to do, or at least the, the the meaning of the definition is to be the finest grain, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive listing of all possible outcomes of a model of an experiment. So whenever you look at a problem and you say what you know what are the possible outcomes. You need to sort of think about, you know, one one approach is to think about the sample space, where you'll spend your time looking at, at the problem, and think about, well, what are all the possible outcomes, and how do I list them in a mutually exclusive way? Um, and so one example of a sequential sample space, um, going back to that example of heads and tails, um, is, uh, you know, here's is is here we're tossing a coin twice, and I want to know what the two possible outcomes are, and you know, one one example would be both heads, heads and tail, uh, tails and heads, and heads and tails. Uh, I, I know that's boring and it's 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 an enumerative, but it's um, if if you can ascribe the probability to each of these things, which we'll talk about in a, in a second, um, you can then decide what the probabilities are that um, that are related to the set of events. And one of the things that that uh, you might describe is the the uh, 
the finest grain set is a type of um, event like H1, H2 is the finest grain event, sorry, finest grain event in this sample space because it's two tosses. But if I ask you, you know, the set of the set of events where um, the first outcome is heads, that actually isn't the event of H1. That's not a um, that's that that's an event, but it's not a finest grain event. So if I said if it, the, if, you, if I asked you to describe the event space in terms of um, H1 and T1, that does in fact cover the entire space. It's collectively exhaustive, but what it's not is it's not a sample space because it's not um, finest grain. And you, it, I guess the point is is that the, the finest grain point is where you stop. Sometimes that's useful. Sometimes that's not. Um, and it just depends on the problem. Um, so moving on from uh, the algebra events, you know, now we've got these points in the space. The next thing is to come up with what's called a measure for it. And in fact, we want to call it the probability measure. And from these three um, measures of events in a sample space, you can actually come up with uh, uh, some notion of a measure that you assign to the space, uh, to a point in the space. Um, and as long as that that value and also values about, uh, with regard to the other val uh, values in that um, that are ascribed to the points in the space correspond to these uh, three axioms, then you in fact have uh, a valid measure and a value in, in valid numbers for those measures. And the ones that we, you know, practically speaking, the ones that we typically use, I mean, I, I guess uh, the, the three things that are important is that, you know, that a probability is never less than zero. Um, the probability of all the events in a space uh, is basically one. And that causes some normalization in terms of, uh, you know, when I have conditioning events like um, if if I told you that, uh, you know, what's the probability that uh, that uh, if I flip a coin uh, that given that it's heads, that that it turned up heads, well, the probability is one, but it's but 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 it's you know it's not 2.5 or something like that. Um, you, and then uh, the last piece is that um, if two sets of events don't intersect, then the probability of the set of events that's the union of them is the sum of the two probabilities of the each set of events. Um, and I guess that last part goes back to what I was saying before. And I guess the last part of this this uh, the thing that I'm going to talk about today is. Um, Something that, oh, actually, before I do that, let me let me talk about one more type of uh, type of sample space. Uh, one 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 thing that that you might do is, uh, uh, you know, talk in two dimensions. Like, uh, if I roll a dice twice, you know, I have, uh, um, you know, this the sample space. Uh, Let's see if I if I have a uh, set of events x1 comma x2 where um, x is uh, x sub n is a member of um, you know uh, is a member of one comma two comma three comma four let's say so it's, let's say that it's a a uh, four side or tetrahedral die or something like that if I say here's uh, Here's two um, here's two throws of that dice. One way you might describe the um, sample space is if I call this x1 and you know n is uh, the the number of the die roll um, in x2. Then one way you might try to describe the sample space is to put it in two dimensions. Or if it's ten things and you do it in ten dimensions, uh, one, two, three, four. Um, then these are all the valid sample points. Um, um, meaning that there are 16 possible outcomes. And this is a nice way to graphically demonstrate it. Now say, for example, could someone come up with uh, an interesting set of events that I could describe on this space? <laughs> I don't know. How about? Uh, how about the event that the uh, second roll is even? Who could tell me how to what what the points in the space are? For that. So, uh, so, two, 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 two. so this one 
in this one? Okay. So that's, I guess, the point is, is that this is a mechanical thing that I'm going through, but it's just trying to show you that what you can do in trying to solve these problems is when, when someone states a problem, they'll tell you that, well, uh, you know, there's some, there's some event, and you, what, the, the, the motion you have to go through is trying to describe the sample space and then subsequently deciding what points in the sample space are in one set versus another, another set. Um, so, 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 what, so, so, so with regard to this, an example might be, um, you know, you, you'd say that, you know, if, if, if this is a non-biased die, meaning that each side is equally likely, um, what, d does someone know what, uh, what the uh, likelihood of a particular event point is? One sixteenth. And how did you get that? Random guessing. Random guessing. Okay. <laughs> well, you, you got that because it's, right, you counted up the dots and you said what's non-biased and it's equally likely. So there's 16 of them and uh, that, gets, that gets you there. Or you could say that the probability that, um, the probability, you know, x1, and we'll talk about independence, you know, tomorrow, I guess, but um, the probability of um, x1 and x2 um, I guess, let's see. For a particular, for a particular, for a particular point here. Um, so, so I guess the last thing I'm going to start to talk about today is the notion of conditional probability and give you an intuitive taste for that. So, um, here, here's an example where um, there's this notion of getting, uh, you know, having a sample space and then getting some extra information and using that to determine what points are or are not valid anymore. Um, so, for example, uh, one thing one thing that that you might say is, um, you know, what's the probability that uh, what's the probability given that uh, the second um, the, what's the probability um, given that the second roll isn't even. So we know that it's not in this space or this point space that um, the that the, uh, that the that that you get uh, a, a one and a one uh, sorry a x one and x two equals one comma one. So what's the probability given that sorry the probability of one comma one given that um, x x two x two is um, is is oh, sorry is odd, or or that it's not even, um, and the way that you sort of do that is you say okay well, you know th these points aren't in that space, but these points are, so and and so there's only eight of them, and since each of these is equally likely, there's a one eighth chance that they'll be, um, that that you'll get that you'll get that, um, and I, and I the other thing that I wanted to sort of talk about in terms of an intuitive understanding of this is that basically the probability that A given B, it's equal to the probability of the intersection of A and B um, divided by the probability of B. What, what's that really saying is, is that the um, probability of A, let me go over here, uh, given B is, um, let's see, that is if you look over here, um, if, I, if I say what's, what's the set of events given B is, it's this set of events, right? Um, meaning that, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the B, B is this, the B is this thing in, inside here. So the, the probability of A given B um, is, well, the set of events is B, and the, the set of events um, A are over here. So that what you do is, is that um, the valid set of points is here. So we're normalizing out from the intersection of A and B, which is this, this piece, is being normalized out by the area of um, of B. Uh, do, do, peop do, do people get that, or is there anyone that doesn't get that? Because uh, I'd be happy to go over it. Because I think it's one of the most important points about probability is that these conditioning events is just actually normalizing out the fact that you got rid of those events. And um, to be honest with you, that's actually all I prepared for today's <laughs> lecture. Um, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, I'll sort of. I, I actually think this is sort of 
a bit to chew, chew, chew off of in the sense that um, later today at about one, um, I'd like to go through some problems with you um, uh, and have you do the problems, and I have some solutions, uh, and we'll talk about um, how those are being solved. Uh, so that's it for today. Can you just tell us a little, what, what is it you do? Oh, what is it you do? Why? A little intro. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so what do I do? Well, I, I'm actually someone who runs Photo.net. Um, I used to work with Luis, who used to, used to, uh, used to, w was teaching. He's actually moved on to, to IBM. Uh, I'm, uh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> what's that? Good move. <laughs> sure, sure. And then, uh, and then, uh, and I also uh, am sort of. I, 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 in the past, I used to be, a, uh, I guess, a, I did my PhD at MIT in electrical engineering and computer science. And um, while I was there, I uh, worked on a, a uh, on inst instant messaging, meaning that I, I started a company that I sold to Microsoft that basically forms the basis for um, their instant messaging uh, architecture. Uh, and so I was there for a little while, um, helping them implement that. And then I came back and started working on uh, Photo.net with um, with everyone. And my wife Lisa is back there, so you might ask her what I do. <laughs> uh, and the other thing that I spend my time doing is uh, investing in uh, in startups and looking at uh, different kinds of opportunities. Um, so that's kind of uh, a little bit about me. I don't know if that. <laughs>